Hello, everyone out there at home. Welcome back to Cambridge University Astronomy. We have a very special talk for you this evening by Georgia Rawlins, who is the writer and musical director of a new scientific uh, or science-based play called Astrid, which is playing at the, uh, the ADC in Cambridge later on uh, next month. Um, so Georgia is going to talk to us today all about the science behind the, uh, her new musical Astrid. Uh, so I'm very excited to hear what's going on. So uh, over to you, Georgia. Hi, thanks, Matt. Um, my name is Georgia. I'm a fourth year student at the IOA. And yeah, I'm going to be talking to you about the science behind Astrid, the real science behind Astrid, but uh, framing it in the context of why space travel is really difficult. So I'll just start my screen share. <coughs> so why is space travel so hard? There are lots and lots of reasons uh, why space travel is really hard. So I'm going to just take you through a few of the most important ones and then also uh, tell you a bit about how we get around these issues in Astrid, the musical. So the first issue with space travel is just how far apart everything is. Everything is like normal units of distance, like meters and miles and kilometers don't make any sense in space. They are just such astronomically small units compared to the scales over which things happen in space. Um, so let's take the fastest probe that we have ever made, the Voyager probes. Voyager probes were launched in 1977 um, and they were launched into the outer solar system to have a look at the planets and they sent back lots of beautiful images. I encourage you to go and have a look at the Voyager probes images um, if you have some time later. They're really gorgeous pictures and they really transformed our understanding of our own solar system. So these were launched in 1977. So, you know, getting on for 40, over 40 years ago now. Um, and they only just a few years ago left our solar system. So Voyager 1 in 2012 and Voyager 2 in 2019. So they took 35 and 42 years respectively to get out of just our solar system. Um, and the Voyager probes are traveling at about 35,000 miles per hour, which is nearly 16 kilometers every single second. So one hell of a speeding ticket if you were <laughs> to get stopped by intergalactic police. Um, but yeah, so they are they are traveling incredibly fast. They are the fastest things we have ever made. And they took 40 years just to get out of our solar system. Our nearest star other than the sun is um, a star called Proxima Centauri, and that is 4.24 light years away. Um, a light year, for anyone that doesn't know, is the distance that light, which is the fastest thing in the universe, travels in a year. So this is a huge, huge number of meters. Um, it's about 10 trillion kilometers, if you're interested in a sort of more normal unit of it. Um, and we measure things in space in light years because everything is so far apart that it doesn't make a lot of sense to do it in kilometers. So at the Voyager speed, which is the fastest we've ever managed to do, um, it would take us nearly 80,000 years to reach our nearest star other than the sun. So for a bit of context to put that number into perspective, humans have only existed for about 300,000 years. So it would take us about a quarter of the lifetime of humanity as a species to get to just the nearest star. And that's only one star out of billions and billions in our galaxy. Um, stars are so far apart that if you took our sun and scaled it down to the size of a fly and put it in London, the nearest star would be in Glasgow and the whole volume of the whole planet Earth would only contain about a thousand stars total. So I hope this gives you a bit of a sort of perspective on just how far apart everything is in space. Um, it's, 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 it's almost impossible to hold it in your head, these numbers. They are just too big to imagine. So this is our first massive problem with space travel is just getting anywhere takes forever. Um, and even seeing exoplanets at this distance is nearly impossible. So an exoplanet is a, a planet that orbits a star that isn't the sun. Um, and we've, we've seen a few thousand of these and almost all of them have been in stars very close to the Earth. A planet doesn't emit its own light, it only reflects its light from its star. So they don't, they're not bright, they're hard to see, they're very small and they're incredibly far away. So even finding a planet that we could aim for is, is virtually impossible. I think only a few days ago, actually, um, there was news about the first extra galactic uh, exoplanets, which is outside of our own galaxy. But until now, every single planet we've found has been in our own galaxy and in nearby stars because they're just impossible to see over the distances we're talking about. <coughs> So the next issue with space travel is resources. So sending a machine to space is fairly easy. We have thousands of satellites in orbit around the Earth and these are fine. They mind their own business and they don't need any resources in the same way that humans do. 
humans are much harder. In order to send a person to space, you obviously have to take care of all of their physical needs. Um, you know, so you need to feed them, you need to water them, you need a source of energy, you need oxygen for them to breathe, and you need to get some way of getting rid of any waste like carbon dioxide in the air. You don't want to poison them by carbon dioxide poisoning. And so doing all of this on a spaceship is really, really hard. Um, so every food chain on Earth, with the exception of bacteria in hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the oceans, all of them start with plants, which starts with the sun, thermal energy from the sun. Uh, allows plants to photosynthesize and then other things eat the plants and we eat other things and and plants themselves so without exception um every food chain on earth starts with a massive energy source either the sun itself or uh, thermal energy from the earth um so what do you do when you take all of your humans and take them away from that energy source generating food is really really hard so how would you grow things in space you would need a method of um you know photosynthesizing you need a light source <coughs> which is something you'd have to power yourself because you would be too far away from the sun for any solar power to make sense water is water is really heavy in order to get it into space you have to lift the weight of the water out of the earth's gravitational field more on that in a minute but um so water is a really not a very efficient thing to take to space um and in terms of how you would actually do it you need you need an energy generation as well you need to keep your humans warm you need to make sure that um you know they're insulated from freezing freezing space outside um which is obviously going to take some sort of power you can't just plug anything into the wall in space there is no wall so um you would need to have some sort of generator on board solar power won't work in interstellar space the stars are too far away so the voyager probes get their power from um I think from nuclear power. So they have a small radioactive source on board and the heat that that generates powers the probe. Um, so this is something we could look into, but obviously a radioactive fuel source will decay and it will have a half-life. And after a certain amount of time, uh, it will stop decaying uh, to any useful level. And so your energy source runs out. Anything we can take with us is finite. So in terms of generating an energy source that could keep you going for 80,000 years, there's nothing we know of that could do that. Um, and then obviously, if you've got something radioactive, you've got to deal with um, the consequences of having radioactive stuff on board your ship. More on that in a minute as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, oxygen is a big one. Uh, they've got to breathe. <laughs> Taking enough oxygen for an 80,000 year journey is uh, ludicrous as a concept. Um, I don't think the Earth itself has enough oxygen in its current state for an 80,000 year journey. You know, it, it's constantly cycled through biological processes and in and out of the oceans. And without those massive reservoirs um, that our planet has, I, there's simply no way you could do that. And in similarly, waste disposal, you know, if you've got to get rid of the carbon dioxide your humans are breathing, you know, every energy process that you use will have some sort of loss. So sure, you could recycle your carbon dioxide and, and turn it back into carbon and oxygen, but that would take energy input from you as well. And there's only sort of so many times you can do that before you actually just run out of resources. So taking enough stuff to keep humans alive in space is a massively challenging thing to do. Um, also leaking. Space is nearly a vacuum, which means the air pressure that you feel around yourself and I feel around myself is simply not there. There is nothing there. Um, and so if you have the inside of your spaceship with high pressure, relatively oxygen at sort of atmospheric pressure thereabouts to keep your humans comfortable, um, and then outside you have nothing, even if your spaceship is 100% airtight, anything over 80,000 years, the oxygen will just leak out, it will diffuse through the steel, and um, you will lose it. So in terms of taking your resources, you've not only got to get them into space, you've also got to, also got to hold on to them for the whole duration of the journey. Fuel is a big one. So, <coughs> excuse me. In order to get out of Earth's gravitational field, you have to accelerate upwards at about 10 meters a second. Um, this is because there is a gravity field that's holding us onto the planet. Um, and in order to get out of that, I mean, I can jump and I will temporarily leave the planet, but I will come back down again because I don't keep going upwards. And so Newton's law states that I need to have, in order to move upwards at any sort of speed, I need to have a net force, well, I need to have a net acceleration upwards. So I can throw a ball and it will come back down again because at some point it will stop accelerating upwards and just be dragged down. The only force acting on it is Earth's gravity. So in order to get out of gravity, um, I need to apply a force that accelerates me upwards. 
there is no known fuel that lifts that is able to lift its own weight out of Earth's gravity well. So I can burn fuel and that will get me sort of, you know, on a plane or on a car or whatever. But in order to go straight upwards and keep accelerating at 10 meters per second, I need to keep continually accelerating in order to get out of Earth's gravity field. And while I do that, I have to lift the weight of all of the fuel that I carry with me. So there is no fuel that exists that is capable of lifting itself, let alone itself and a rocket and cargo and people and, you know, all the resources that you would need. So you might think we're in a bit of a conundrum here because how do we get anything off the planet? How do we have any satellites? Um, the reason we've been able to do satellites is because we leave something behind. So as you burn your fuel, you eject your waste products, your water and your um, carbon dioxide that are products of combustion. You eject them and then because you have got rid of mass, you are then able to generate enough lift to get out of the Earth's gravity field. <coughs> so in order to get out of the Earth's gravity field at all, you have to leave something behind. It's Newton's third law. You know, it, every force has an equal opposite, equal and opposite reaction. In order for me to go up, I have to push something else down. Um, so in terms of fuels that we know about, traditional rocket fuel is not an efficient fuel. And then if you think about how much stuff we'd have to carry to get humans into space at all, um, you know, we'd have to do uh, water, which is really dense and more on uh, more interesting things we'd have to take in a minute. Um, and remember, every extra kilogram that you add resources, people, whatever, means you need more fuel to, to get them off the ground. But then if you add more fuel, you add more weight. And so you need more fuel to take the weight of the extra fuel. And this just becomes a cycle and a cycle and a cycle. And eventually you will hit a point at which it is simply not possible to get off the ground at all. So fuel is a really big consideration. Um, fuel is heavy. Fuel is not really worth the, the effort it takes to lift. But it's the only way we've worked out of getting off the planet in the first place. <coughs> another <coughs> excuse me another <coughs> sorry i've got fresh as flu as we all do another massive issue in space is radiation so um space is is pretty radioactive to be honest um any star will be throwing out a huge amount of radiation um part of that is visible light so light the light we get from our sun is peaked in the visible and ultraviolet infrared ranges so that's about the middle of the electromagnetic spectrum. But this is a spectrum and there are waves on all wavelengths. So at the longer end, we have things like radio waves, microwaves, things that we find very useful on Earth through to um, infrared, visible light, which is what we see, um, and then ultraviolet, which is getting towards being dangerous. And then we hit the very dangerous end of the scale, which is X-rays and gamma rays. So um, you'll know if you've ever had an X-ray in hospital, the doctor doesn't stay in the room with you because one X-ray is fine. But if you are doing X-rays all day, every day, they are very dangerous. Um, similarly, gamma radiation causes cancer. This is what makes radioactive things dangerous. So in order to protect ourselves from that, um, well, on, on Earth, our atmosphere does this for us. So um, we are protected on Earth by our magnetic field. So any star will have a sort of wind of very charged, very dangerous particles coming off it. Um, and what our magnetic field does on Earth is it channels all of those uh, particles to the poles. And this is where we get the northern or the southern lights, as you can see in the picture. Um, so that is charged particles interacting with our atmosphere and re releasing light as they do so. Um, so that's all very well and good. But without a magnetic field, that radiation is directly exposed to the people in the ship. Um, unless they've got some sort of shielding. Um, incidentally, we think this is what happened on Mars to get rid of its atmosphere because Mars didn't have a strong enough magnetic field to protect it and its atmosphere was literally scoured away by the solar wind. Um, so, you know, it's it's, a, it's no laughing matter. It's, it's really dangerous radiation. And without some sort of shielding, your astronauts would almost certainly have, you know, some sort of cancer or radiation sickness, which wouldn't be much fun. Um, so yeah, you'd need to bring some sort of shielding. Unfortunately, uh, shielding that can block radiation tends to be very heavy. So you'd use something like lead or concrete and taking a kilogram of concrete to space is um, fundamentally a waste of fuel. It's a ridiculously heavy thing to get off the ground and we go back to the same fuel problems that we had before. <coughs> so yeah, without the production of a magnetic field, um, you would have a lot of radiation in space, which would be really, really dangerous. So, on to Astrid. How does Astrid get round each of these problems? Um, 
so uh, just I want to preface this by saying I am an astrophysicist, but Astrid is very much sci-fi. We've taken some of the core concepts, some real concepts, um, but, uh, you know, slightly edited them um, to make them more of a functional storyline. And, you know, in order to see that storyline, you'll have to come and see it next week. Um, but yeah, so in terms of what we've done, <coughs> we have invented a lightweight futuristic radiation shield. So this is allowing them to bypass the radiation issue. They have this shielding that protects the ship and it's lightweight enough that it doesn't really cause a fuel issue. Nevertheless, this is still an issue for the ship. Um, they have joins between compartments, are very radioactive, this is an issue for them. And also they end up going very close to a neutron star, more on that in a second, which is a very radioactive star. Um, and this basically fries their sensors so they can't see how the outside of the ship is doing. Um, so yeah, this is a, a very important plot point in Astrid and something we've had to really consider when writing it. Uh, if anyone doesn't know, a neutron star is a dead star. For it, it's a remnant of a star that was very, very big. The whole thing weighs about as much as one, one and a half of our suns, but the whole thing is compressed into a radius of about 20 kilometers. So these things are tiny, you know, that's, uh, you know, a town size, if that, um, but they weigh the whole sun. Um, they are incredibly dense. And what that happens is a star at the end of its life runs out of fuel and collapses in on itself under its own gravity. Um, and when that happens, all of the atoms get packed really, really closely together and you end up with this incredibly dense object. I mean, if I had a, a teaspoon of neutron star, that would weigh about, uh, you know, about a trillion kilometer, uh, a kilograms, which is a, a stupidly big number. Um, I mean, the tallest building on Earth, which is the Burj Khalifa, um, it's nearly a kilometer tall. And a teaspoon of neutron star would weigh about a thousand of those buildings, just a teaspoon. So yeah, these are incredibly extreme objects. So we've slightly bent the rules of, of, of physics by putting a, light, a neutron star three light years from Earth. So this is closer than our actual nearest star is. Um, we would know about it if there was a neutron star that close. Um, while this is an astronomically huge distance, in terms of the scale of the universe, it's it's next door. Um, in fact, we probably wouldn't have evolved at all if there was a neutron star that close. It would The radiation coming off these things is incredible. Um, so yeah, this is a key plot point in Astrid and they get around the radiation issue by using some lightweight radiation shielding that bypasses the issue of taking heavy shielding to space. <coughs> so Astrid also makes use of a phenomenon called time dilation. So Einstein's theory of relativity states that basically the faster you move through space, the slower you move through time. And this sounds like uh, fiction, but it's really not. It's a genuine mathematical theory and it has massive real world consequences. Um, the most obvious example is things like sat navs. So sat navs are, we use satellites in space. They are in a weaker gravitational field and moving very fast. And so they have a very slightly different internal clock. And this is not a question of, oh, the clocks have got out of sync, their time actually runs slower. Um, so we have to correct for this, otherwise all of our sat-navs would go out of alignment and this would happen within a day or two. That's how um, significant the effect is if we didn't correct for it. So they run out of fuel, they have, they have catastrophic oxygen loss at some point in the show and they've been going 15 years at this point and they have to get home in just five because that's the amount of oxygen they have left. So what they do is they use a gravitational slingshot. They go round this neutron star, take some energy from it in order to speed up. Um, and they end up going fast enough that they can return home in only five years for them. The faster you move through space, the slower you move through time. So that's a really fun piece of physics. Um, it's, it's quite a difficult theory, but it's conceptually really lovely. Um, I would encourage you to, if you're interested, go and have a look. There's some excellent videos on YouTube about relativity and some you know, BBC space things, um, things like that, which are really lay out the basics of it really clearly. Um, and it's a really beautiful theory. I really like it. And I did one line of real relativity for this show. So yeah, the cast have enjoyed learning about this. Um, on Astrid's spaceship, uh, the Mara, there is a fleet of robots, which takes care of the fact that the journey time is so astronomically long. The robots obviously don't need oxygen, they don't need food, they only need power, so they save massively on their resource budget by doing this. Um, and yeah, so that's the kind of bulk of uh, issues that Astrid deals with. We've moved the distance <laughs> because there's simply no way of getting around that. We've had uh, futuristic fuel that gets them going very fast in the first place, lightweight radiation shielding to protect them, 
and then they use a couple of phenomena, time dilation and gravitational slingshots so that they can speed up enough to make it home. So um, if you are interested in the show, uh, please do come and see it at the ADC Theatre running next week, Tuesday till Saturday, 2nd to the 6th of November. Um, and I will leave you with a beautiful publicity image designed by Emily Shen um, with the relevant dates and locations. And yeah, I'm really happy to answer any questions. If you have any, please drop me an email um, or you know get in touch with me or anyone on the production team. Um, and yeah, it would be really lovely to see you at the theatre so you can see us discussing some of these concepts in a bit more detail and with a fabulous cast and band and company. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Georgia. I, I can't wait to see this play. I think it's really exciting. Just one, one thing I kind of wanted to just was wondering, because it's quite unusual, <coughs> maybe, at least uh, you know, in terms of outside sci-fi or outside really hard sci-fi, to see these terms like relativity and time dilation and stuff uh, being included for plot reasons. Like what was the most, what, what do you think was the most difficult piece of science that you had to walk, work in? I think um, the relativity was probably the hardest thing we had to get in um, because it, it is a very well-known theory if you are a scientist or if you're an astrophysicist, but if you're not, the first time you're introduced to it, I remember the first time I heard about this, it absolutely blew my mind and getting your head around the fact that it's not just I go faster therefore I get there quicker it's I go faster therefore my internal clock slows down um and having that as, a, as an idea and once you think about it it makes perfect sense but it's it's a really foreign concept and so getting that across in an accessible way that also drives the plot has been really fun and a challenge for the cast but I think they're managing it great and yeah we're very excited yeah, no, absolutely. I think the the universe is a very <coughs> strange place, right? And I think it's really exciting that people like you are making these wonderful uh, creative pieces of art in response um, and let us, yeah, let, let us explore these scientific topics in all kinds of new ways. Um, Georgia, thank you so much. Um, I yeah, hope you enjoyed uh, this talk and learning a bit about Astrid. And um, I hope you can join me and uh, hopefully lots of other people in the astronomy department in seeing Astrid when it uh, is on at the theatre. Cool. Bye. Thanks for having me. There we go.